Well, Betty, I'm just tickled to be able to interview you uh, formally. We've had lunch together. We've had wonderful times out together. So I have a little bit of an edge. I even have some questions in my mind to ask you because I know some of the answers. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for joining us. And ahead of time, congratulations on your Lifetime Achievement Award for SAG. Well, darling, thank you. So I shouldn't call him darling. Thank you so much. I am in awe, Mr. President. I'm so <laughs> proud of you and so thrilled, and we are so lucky to have you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, I have a series of, of questions here that staff worked out that are marvelous, and I will refer to them. But I, I noticed with these questions, the, the second to the last question, which began uh, now that we're wrapping things up, and it's where I want to start, because I, I want you to talk about your involvement with animals, and the protection of animals and what an important part of your life that is because I think it has a great deal to do with you and how you work and your artistry and the whole thing you bring to the workplace. So I'd love to start at the end because it's so much who you are and just have you talk about it. Oh, Ken, bless your heart. I'm the luckiest old broad on two feet because my life is divided absolutely in half. Half animals, animal work, and half show business. The two things I love the most and to still be able to work, work at them after, well, a lifetime with animals, but 61 years in show business, uh, how lucky can you get at this late date in your life? But animals have always been, I'm not into animal rights and activism, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. I'm into animal health and welfare. Right. I've been with the Morris Animal Foundation for 43 years now. We're a health organization. We fund humane research into specific health problems of dogs, cats, horses, and zoo and wildlife. And we help develop the feline leukemia vaccine and the parvovirus vaccine, that kind of thing. And then I've been with the Los Angeles Zoo for just that long, and uh, it's a different zoo than it was 43 years ago. Right. Mm. Right. I just think it's part of who you are, too, in the workplace, if without... Uh embarrassing you but you know you're a great ensemble performer and everyone knows that you're very very giving uh, to others and I've I've been there seen how you work with others and I think uh, you have a wonderful big open heart and you're very good uh, I think uh, almost protective I've seen you be this way of those who maybe aren't as strong who can't speak for themselves whether they're little animals or just performers with a line or two you uh -huh. know on the set you, it's, it's I think it's very much a part of who you are. I think of this because of my new job here as, as President oh, of Screen Actors wonderful Guild, job and aren't we lucky. Which is speaking for those who can't speak for themselves. That's a lot. right. A lot, a lot of that really is what's, what's going on. Well, here's the question. I know the answer and I just so want uh, people to hear this answer. When we were out, it was years ago, and I asked you uh, what was the first time that you were on camera, that you'd been, uh, you know, on, on, I think I said on a television camera, and your answer just caught me by surprise, it, and people don't know this answer, which is way earlier than what one would expect. Do you know where I'm heading with this? It was, it was when we graduated, Beverly Hills High School. Be Beverly Hills Be High Beverly School. Beverly High, and uh, I wore my graduation dress, and we were down at the, in the, sh uh, they were doing an experimental TV thing, and it was 1939. And we, the audience walked around among the Packard cars down on the showroom, and we were up on the fifth floor in this little hot room doing the Merry Widow. Uh, the, the senior class president and I, I wore my graduation dress, and we sang this wonderful Lehar music. And it, was, it got so hot, we had brown makeup on it. And it was so hot, and we were so romantic, and the makeup all was running like this. But that was, that was, we didn't have television out here then. That was just an experimental thing feed from New York. Well, I think it's only right that not only were you a pioneer in television, but that you were on television before anybody knew there was television. <laughs> yeah, there was, and literally, literally, right. nobody knew that there was. And then when you did start in television, if I, tell me if I have my facts right, but, but from very early on, you were you were in control. You you were part of the producing and ownership. And I advice. was very lucky, but I had a 
well, Al Jarvis was. It was a five and a half hour a day, six day a week show. Mm. No script or anything, just all ad lib. But that wasn't enough for for Al. He also wanted an hour variety show in the evening. So I'd sing a couple of songs, and then we'd have amateur singers come on, and whoever won of the amateur singers, the prize was singing on our show the next week. So, but. Uh, for my songs, we would do a little sketch in, into the song, a little husband and wife sketch, and then the payoff, the joke line, would be the title of the song, and I'd go into the song. Well, Don Federson called us into the office one day and said, could you make that into a situation comedy? You know, just the husband and wife thing? And in my wisdom, I said, well, a half hour, I mean, it's one thing, an anecdote. You'll tell that in an evening. But nothing, no joke will hold up for a half hour. You can't do a half hour situation. That's how smart I was. <laughs> Brilliant. And uh, I said, you just, it just won't work. But we can, we can do three of them, maybe incident number one, incident number two. So that was my first series, Life with Elizabeth. Absolutely. And a wonderfully successful one. I'm great. Put you on the <laughs> I was so smart, you can't do a half hour. Sorry. You, you know, my sense of you from, from early on, too, was that I, when I first really got to know you, and I knew somehow your background, and I knew from singing and dancing on the stage and everything else, was your wit in the various panel shows in television, and how fast and funny and terrific and all that. This is before you know Mary Tyler Moore, before Sue, all, all in that period of time. It was really my first uh, knowledge of you, and I think of a lot of Americas, that they really knew you. I, I said later to friends, I meant it, I said that the problem for comedy writers with Betty is they have to be at least as funny as she is without no, any writing. No, no. So, you know, but yeah. really, I think a lot of America got to know you, and you, you, you yourself, with the questions and the repartee and all the various Well, stuff. you couldn't, that there wasn't a straight man in our family. I, I mean that in a nice way. <laughs> but it, uh, I was an only child, and my mother and dad and I would have, you know, Sunday breakfasts, and we'd have driving vacations, and we'd have dinners together, and it was we'd have wonderful conversations. But it, we were kidding each other and teasing each other. And dad was a salesman; he would bring jokes home, and they'd never explain them to me. But I had to either, if I got them, fine; if I didn't, fine. But he'd say. Now, honey, you can take that one to school. I wouldn't take that one to school. <laughs> I, I don't think so. But the game shows were wonderful because that was, you were doing the same kind of kidding with the other, other game players. And it, it was really like going to television college. It was great. I was going to ask you about that, that. That, I would imagine in some way, I'd love to hear you talk about the impact of that kind of experience on... Uh, on then acting these roles in sitcoms because it's all a, you know we gain from all kinds of other experience and I sometimes like wondered if that wasn't a great training ground. And for you it. have to think on your feet right. in the games and the beauty of it is you get so involved in playing the game that you don't get self-conscious you're concentrating on the game that's why I loved I loved watching celebrity game shows because the people were so involved playing the game that they weren't doing their image. They were being themselves. Right, and exactly. Uh -huh. I also had the feeling with you, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, that I know you did stage work and were very good at it, but I was wondering... Summer stock, uh, never Broadway. But I was wondering even there that, uh, that because of your facility that I would think you'd like the, the change in television all the time of new stuff rather than the same show night after night. I it just know seems theater people get upset when you say that and they say, but it's a different experience every night. But you're still saying the same blinking line, <laughs> you know, no matter how you try. And uh, I, I'm just not a theater person. I, that, and theater people look down on movie people, and movie people look down on television people. Well, I've been in television all my life, so I was at the bottom of the barrel. You're looking for someone to look down on. <laughs> no, well, yes, well, there's I, always reality television. I, <laughs> well, that I, I manage. I manage. Um, talk, a, <laughs> talk a bit about. Uh, 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 the young, there are going to be young actors out there who are going to say, you know, they always want to know what, what, is the, what is the key or what should I think about or what's, uh, in a nutshell, what you do and what you think of as an actor, what, what's the, 
a special thing that you know, you know, that, that from your own experience that you would suggest to them in terms of how to work, what to think about? I, I get that question a lot, you think. know, from, from young people. And I always say, don't come out of the set with an attitude. And don't, I mean, don't pick out the people you like and the ones you don't like and maybe, you, you know, have an, don't come on with that kind of a, be prepared to like everybody. And I don't mean be goody two-shoes, I just mean don't let anybody start with a negative. Because negatives grow, they breed, and they, if you bring something negative onto the set, it, it, it's there and you can't sweep it under the carpet. But I said, always come in prepared. Don't say, oh, I didn't get a chance to look, or I, I, I like the illusion of the first time, so I didn't learn my lines. Know your lines, know your body, and listen. And you can kid around, you can horse around, and play with everybody else on the set, but when, when it gets down to business, be sure you're listening and concentrating on what your director is saying, what the producer is saying, what the writers are saying, and it'll, It'll bring a different attitude. Don't be so self-focused. Listen to them. Oh, that's great. And coming from you. Now, let's talk about how good you are at playing, uh, playing naughty. You know, you're just great at that. More and more from, uh, from, from David Kelly to going all the way back. Everybody just loves the way with that little sweet smile. You can come in. The Golden Girls was like that. You had it in, the, in, in that one way, the naive kind of character. You also had in Mary. I just think you're always great at... Being the one that you with that sweet smile, who's just uh... well, Joanne Nivens was <laughs> such fun because she was the neighborhood nymphomaniac. Right, right. But she, she did it, it. She thought she was the most gorgeous, glamorous, wonderful person in the world. Nobody else in the world thought that except Suanne about right. Suanne. Right. And she went to Chicago once on a convention. And she couldn't wait to call up all the men she knew there. Well, nobody was home, or they had moved, and she would, they never called her back. It was, it was, it was great, great fun. <laughs> Going back to the, the advice to the young actors, did you by any chance see Betty Davis one night? She was on one of the late night talk shows. I don't, I don't know which one. And somebody said, what advice would you give to a young actress trying to get started in Hollywood? She said, take fountain. <laughs> I know. I just I love it. I just love it. <laughs> he just killed me. Take fountain. For those who are not Los Angeles oriented, fountain is a street that you, you, you miss a lot of the traffic on other streets. So if you take fountain, you can get right into many of the studios much quicker. And it just, I fell off the couch. You know, I think of, of you in relation to something else she said, Betty Davis. She talked about with that manner of her, how she missed the big personalities, that she liked the idea on film and, and the performers that were larger than life and bigger yes, than life. Yes, yes. And, and, and you do this. That's kind of what I was trying to get at with the talk shows. You, you have a big personality that we're used to and expect, and then you kind of have whatever that process is of, of infusing it into a role. In these latest films that you've done, audiences are just so tickled that it's you being grandma what was her name the proposal oh i'm a grab that was grandma annie grandma annie and from I, the moment you show up there's such a history you bring to it that people are already laughing ahead of time because they know that there's going to be oh, bless you know, you know, and i just d did another disney film with sigourney weaver and jamie lee curtis oh, and i was grandma bunny and that i'm almost grandma something <laughs> you know whatever <laughs> well that's great good exciting um Tell me about do-overs. I don't mean regret, but one of those questions that, you know, if you had to do it over, I, I never know quite how to answer that question when I'm asked myself, but it, it's an interesting one. If you had something you could do over, if there was a choice you would do a little differently, is there something like that? Because uh, you've had a wonderful life, and I know you're not given to regret or negativism, but still, I just wondered if there's In an area. In all honesty, Ken, I think I can truly say, Oh, I could have made better choices and, you know, all that. But I don't think I'd ever want to do over something because I, I never tried to cheat and I never tried to, to, you know, sneak or stuff like that. So those are the things, if you did that, that you'd want to do over and do better. 
But as far as the other, I've been so lucky and so much has come to me out of sheer blind luck that I'm just so grateful at this point in time to still be working. I'm going to be, in next month in, in January, I'm going to be 88 years old and I, I'm still working and I'm still enjoying and I'm still having fun and I'm blessed with good health. The only thing I would have, it's not a do-over that I could do, but it, losing Alan was a, was a tough one. Yeah. And uh, I'd do anything because he, I think what I first fell in love with, with Alan Ludden was his enthusiasm. He, he was interested in everything and everything was never, oh yeah, oh, oh no. it was always, yeah, tell me about it. And that's, that's fun to live with. And you're both inquisitive, though. You're both inquisitive and had bright minds. I love the idea of the combination. You, you told me some wonderful stories about uh, just uh, how much fun the two of you had just talking the hours away into the night, you know. Uh, or he'd call me up, we'd be working separate places, and he'd call me up and he'd say, how about a date tonight? Want to go out to dinner? <laughs> and I, he was sure, well, going out to dinner meant he would stop on the way home and pick up a chicken and come home and throw it on the barbecue. Then we'd go out, there's another room behind my house, and we'd go out there, put on some records, and have our chicken and dance. All by ourselves, it's, it's silly, but, but it's, it's silly maybe to the rest of the world, but it was fun for us. It sounds wonderfully romantic. Back to this, uh, you know, I'm, I'm dealing more and more with young, uh, young performers uh, that I might not as much because of this new job, what they're thinking, and they're, they're new. Mm -hmm. And a question that I wanted to ask you that I get asked a lot is what image I had in my mind. It's hard to remember, you know, what were your dreams or your aspirations when you were starting? And I, I, I get lost. I remember thinking, uh, being so excited when I got it, the first time I got a job in Summerstock. And then I remember being excited that I got a role on Broadway, you know, but I don't know if I had a big overwhelming picture, except I wonder if I can make a living at this. But I wondered if you had a, an image you remember from all the way back in the Merry Widow days of what you wanted to be, what you wanted to try. Something. I wouldn't be in show business if it weren't for Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. I was so, I saw Naughty Marietta 48 times. <laughs> I, I mean, I could have put myself through college for what I spent on going to see Naughty Marietta. And uh, I was about 13, 14 at the time. And I didn't just like Jeanette McDonald. I was Jeanette McDonald. That was what I, I, and of course I was in love with Nelson Eddy. And I thought he needed a much younger woman. He <laughs> married an older lady. <laughs> yeah, much younger, much younger woman. <laughs> But uh, that was always sort of, but I never, uh, I would go around knocking on doors to, you know, I didn't, and the first question was, do you have your union card? Well, you had to have a job to get your card, and uh, you couldn't get the job unless you had your card. So finally, Fran Van Hardisville, a wonderful producer, said, I, I've got a one-line thing, all you have to do is say Merry Christmas, but it'll get you your union card, that'll help. So I went home and asked my dad if I could borrow enough money to, to, there was a, you know, the dues that you had to pay. He said, sure, honey. I said, I'll pay you back. He said, no, that's all right. If you don't work too often, we can almost afford it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you for this, and thank you. Uh, I hope I'll be able to... Uh, get you to come back here and there. Just your spirit and your goodwill and, and what you represent is this union over quite a long, remarkable period of time and career going back uh, to the very beginning of, of, of television and, and uh, of the business as we know it. You're, you're a force of nature and we love you and uh, well, love that we can, can honor you in this way. But may I say how lucky all of us in the business are that, that you have gain this new position because now we can get some unity, we can get some some agreement. We're all in this business together and let's work together. Let's not work in opposition with each other. And you've espoused that from the beginning and I'm so thrilled, Mr. Great. President. Great. 
Well, good. One of the things I'm going to try to do, and I'll have you in mind all the time, is bring more and more laughter back into the Screen Actors Guild meetings that's been <laughs> sorely lacking. And that's always a good sign, even when you're doing battle. Well, thank you again for joining us. This has been a delight for me. Thank you, darling. And keep up the good work. Thanks, man.